thank you all so much for providing such a rich and fertile ground for discussion going forward. Um, I think there was, there's so much, and we've only got 10 minutes. We seem to have uh, slightly overrun, so I'm not going to hog the questions too, for too long. But um, one of the things that I wanted to pick up on was the idea of the durational and time and sort of st sticking with creative people in place for, for a little moment. And my experience of working with Stephen Turner and his ex Brieg, which was in uh, Burnley as part of the Super Slow Way. And I think you are their critical, critical friend, if I'm right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's right. Yeah. Pro properly critical, Pro proper, critical proper friend. Proper critical friend, <laughs> yeah, which apparently. is, I He's need one of those. super critical friend. Super <laughs> critical friend, Abs yeah. absolutely. Uh, I think I need one of those. Um, <laughs> what was really interesting uh, with, with Stephen's project, uh, it, we were very lucky to have the egg with us in Milton Keynes for a period of time, but just the recollection of that journey, of that year-long residency. Stephen's Expert Egg, for those that don't know, is this amazing giant wooden egg which functions as his home and studio, um, which obviously is based on a canal. It was in Burnley for a year, and just the description of the process of engaging that community, which was in the beginning, incredibly hard one. It took a very, very long time for them to even begin to trust this strange entity that had landed. But over that time, over that year period, when, it, when Stephen came to us and we invited those families to join us here, the love that they had for not only the egg and their egg man, but the actual experience of being in that place and using that as a conduit to talk about where they lived was incredibly inspiring. And I think I was just very interested in that whole programme of resource that's available to communities and the opportunity to have a, a brilliant cultural experience in a place where they live and to bring that into your idea of place guarding. Mm. Um, yeah, I mean, for me, it, it, um, it is all about the, what the people want. I think there is, a, there, there is with, with, the, with Stephen's egg, uh, there still is and was the period of, of acclimatizing yeah. right, the communities to this massive egg, basically, <laughs> which, which is quite strange. And, 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 and you've, you've, right, you've described that process rather beautifully. Um, but I think, and I think one of the things like, for me about place guarding um, is that it goes beyond that. So it's beyond the artist deciding on an egg. And trying to bring this egg into the community and as a as a spectacle of sorts mm -hmm. initially at least as a which is a, a hook yeah. to draw people in yeah and it works and it's it, there's nothing at all wrong with that and I think in terms of the longevity of the processes uh, the the projects the lifespan we talked about and um, Nick mentioned as well and mm. I think for me you, the, commu the the way to guarantee long term uh, value <coughs> it would within communities is if communities own it mm -hmm. and decide on what that is before. So is that it, 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 for me, the, there was no need. There, there's other ways without needing an egg, which can be, <laughs> if the community decides to want an egg, great. But when the artist brings a massive egg and plumps it down, then that, there's, it's a difference between community-led and artist-led yeah. practice, I think, which is really at the core of, of, of some of the stuff that Cara has been discussing. Yeah, but mm. well, that duration thing as well. So getting to the point, even when the community go, this is what we want, mm -hmm. that can still take years. That conversation yeah. can take years and years. And things like an egg can be an amazing catalyst yeah. for that. And just the very beginning of the conversation, but then it has to launch into yeah. something else. Yeah, yeah. yeah, the legacy of that, yeah. what, what yeah. comes next. And I think that, yeah. that that's something that Stephen touched on. But I'm going to open this up to oh, many, many hands. <laughs> um, okay. Can I just make Please. one point? Yeah, I mean, yes. I just think that the... There are two aspects of this dura durational issue. The first is you don't create a work of art and a wish on the part of the community to be engaged with it and for it to reflect their passions and sympathies and interests overnight. And one of the challenges, I think, for creative people and places is going to be the funding as we go forward. Mm. Yeah. Because in principle, like all funding bodies, the Arts Council thinks to itself, well, we'll start a scheme and then other people will be, come along and find the money to help keep it going. Mm -hmm. So the initial commitments were made for a number of years. Um, I mean, we're working with some of those organisations to think about how we can, within those communities, bring new money to them. Mm -hmm. But we're going to have to think about how we sustain them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. After all, 
we started funding the Royal Opera House in 1946. I believe we're still funding it. <laughs> <laughs> no one has said, well, actually, Stephen has said, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you, 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 take, take, take it all away. Anyway, that's another story. But actually, the other, issue, the other issue I think that has really come up that I think is really a challenge is this question of long-term ownership and stewardship mm -hmm. yep. um, and creating new, new structures mm -hmm. that will allow that to be effective because... Of course, there are local authorities in this country that are still doing a really good job. But I'm afraid there are also quite a lot that are abandoning certain responsibilities. Libraries is one example. Mm -hmm. And ha finding ways of sustaining libraries, for instance, um, across the country. You know, in some places, trusts and mutuals have been mm -hmm. established, like Libraries Unlimited in Devon and they're proving to be really successful. One of the reasons they were successful is partly leadership, mm -hmm. but it's also the fact that they've sought to engage the community in a different, in a different kind of relationship. And I think that's just a thinking hmm. on a very, sorry, I'm going to stop very soon and open up to questions, but on a very sort of pragmatic, many conversations that, that Shane and I are involved with within the local authority here, is there is resource, I think, again, Katie mentioned it earlier, but it's just how we use it really strategically and really mm. effectively. I mean, S106 is a huge, there's huge potential there. There is com complexity, but there is potential. But anyway, let's, let's open up to, okay, please. Thank you. Thanks very much. Hi, uh, um, my name's Mandy McIntosh. I'm from Glasgow and I'm doing a, I'm a big fan of Stevens. That's why I'm here. Um, I'm doing a PhD at Glasgow School of Art and what I'm looking at are the potentials of actually removing artists from communities because the schemes and the areas that I tend to work in in Glasgow, peripheral places, housing estates, um, I guess the kind of um, little brothers and sisters of new towns mm -hmm. are cluttered with artists. You can't move for artists. Oh, wow. <laughs> um, and they don't That's really, really and I'm speaking as an artist who's yeah. done social engaged practice and they don't achieve that much. Mm -hmm. And it's, okay. a real it's actually a real concern. Mm -hmm. Um, I, um, I'm interested that, that Nicholas mentioned um, the social justice movement because the reality is we have actually been doing this since the 60s or 70s. Mm -hmm. We do have a discipline. We have the discipline of community development, which mm -hmm. is taught in universities, mm -hmm. which gives us the model for this mm -hmm. practice, mm -hmm. um, which is about hearing communities and listening to communities and understanding as well that, that creative placemaking at its roots has a social justice element. Um, and that's something that we really need to remember. It's just, just an observation. Uh, also, the other thing I want to talk about is free labour. Mm -hmm. The fact that many, many <coughs> members of communities get involved in placemaking projects and provide free labour, which, yeah. which is undocumented and unpaid and is really important. Mm -hmm. And when, when communities are cluttered with artists, they tend to pull on the same people over and over again mm -hmm. to participate in their work, mm -hmm. which is problematic. So just some observations. Thank you. Yeah, well, it's a safe Simon's legs. Um, just a quick point, because I realise I've already had my turn to talk today, but um, I just worry that something that's not gone acknowledged, um, that I'm sure everyone will be quick to acknowledge, is that the, the term community, we're in danger of using it as a sort of community. It's static. It's, it's sort of like, you know, thing-like. And whenever anybody works in a community <coughs> for any length of time, they realise that people don't even identify themselves as being in a community or that they don't see themselves as the same as their neighbours, they don't see themselves as the same as the next neighbourhood. Yeah. So it's just, um, I just kind of wanted to sort of make sure that yeah. we're kind of going forward with the idea that community as, the problems with defining placemaking is one thing, but the d problems of defining community are also legion. <laughs> well, there's no, there is no community that there are and, and just like there isn't, even in terms of the, the, the ideas around cultural democracy, that in itself, and that includes the movement of which I'm a coordinator, co co-organizer. That's false because what I always say is there's, there's, there are every community is unique, everyone's different. That we have infinite possibilities, infinite. That you know that we can imagine. Everyone is relational and it's situational as well. It depends mm -hmm. on each location on the family ties and the histories and the people coming into the area and all the other problems, mm. all of which manifest themselves as 
a community of communities even there interacting complexly and that's what I'm trying to get across at with the idea of social that rather than place making maybe we need to start talking about space making and understand that that that, that, that space is socially produced and that those social productions are unique to each place of, because place is too concrete and, and once you start talking about a concrete thing like place you start talking about a concrete thing like the community or you know whatever else and I think that's where the problems lie because it, it's, it's about complexities and infinite infinite possibilities not a singularity a normative position which funding bodies or funding is tend to like yeah, yeah. But do you, do you, going back to that <coughs> that's touching on your role as a sort of communicator or conduit that essentially the the cultural prism or the cultural role within that is is to, is to do that, is to help knit, not knit, mm. but give a voice to that mm. complexity to a certain extent? Uh, it's something I talk about. Like, basically, I, for me, I consider my role as some sort of mediator. Mm -hmm. And that mediation, to be fair, is in, in the project I've talked about, funded by Arts Council England on every occasion, mm. and, and Historic England and Heritage Lottery Fund. So it is actually part of, of this, 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 this cultural production, part of, part of mm. our, our scene. Um, uh, but I think, that, um, I think that the role of the mediator is really problematic. Right, and for me, I'm constantly considering ethic, ethical mm. position because, to be honest with you, I'm, I am working class and I've had to work hard. I come from Jarrow and I've, I've had to work hard to, to become, to get where I am and I've recruited a lot of cultural capital. But that means I'm incre increase, incredibly privileged. And, and community members said to me, when I, I get them things, this is how bad, when I speak, people listen to, and, and they, so in, in, in Durham, they've been given land to keep forever, right, which has been demolished, pit houses, to which they can use creatively. We're doing all sorts of creative projects. It's all great. But they asked for that land themselves. Okay. And they were told no. And when I came in, I listened. Mm. And all I did was, was echo their voice. Back to them. And suddenly the answer was yes. And, that, and that's, prob that's something problematic, mm. deeply problematic. That's a whole other symposium, mm -hmm. I think, that, that <laughs> discussion. Um, mm -hmm. OK, uh, Stuart, I can hit, see your hand very high up the back there, so over to you. Uh, so that looks like there might be a long list of questions. <laughs> Stuart Town, architect. <laughs> oh, very good. I want, I want to just, I just wanted to put a focus on where we might be going, the way, the way forward. And what I wanted to pick up on was um, your introduction, Fiona, but also there was one reference that Katie used, which I picked up on. Industry without art is brutality, Ruskin. And it was that industry as aspect, that facet that we really haven't touched on, but I think is actually at the core of, of a lot of this from a structural way, way forward. Anthony referred to the growth here in terms of the million homes and the Oxford Cambridge art. So I'd put it like, would like to put it in that context, but that as a, a basic model. The, there is an economic vision, and th within that economic vision, they talk of clusters of clusters. They talk about knowledge-led innovation. They, si they have six pillars, life sciences, aerospace, advanced manufacturing, transport, energy, creative digital. Now, where, what's that all about? But one thing they then do come up with, mm. and this is the one that really fascinates me, inclusive economic growth. I haven't got a clue what that is, but it's a link of those including inclusive in an economic vision that I think there is a link there and there's something that we really need to get on with. Because they then start talking about robust growth that can support social infrastructure. And so I carry on. And I look at the drivers that they talk about, and what I don't see within the drivers that are taking this model forward are art, culture, and the creative industries. Mm -hmm. So what I'm putting a plea forward for is that you should be out there, mm -hmm. have the confidence to say within that economic vision, that creative driver is a central part of that model. And you've got to get that positioning. And if you don't get that positioning, right at the start, you're always on catch up. 
So I would ask for that to be done straight <laughs> away, to get out there. Th thank you, Stuart. Does, does, would anyone like to respond there is a role. to that call for, <laughs> <laughs> call for action? Well, I think, uh, well, I quite, that's, that's quite an ask for, for an afternoon's work, Stuart. Work. We, yes, absolutely. Uh, OK, well, I think we've got time for... Yes, please. Um, we'll, we'll come down and then we'll go across. Oh, sorry. actually. Oh, uh, sorry. No, simple. What? Simple okay, question. simple then, and then we'll go, if that's okay. Thank you. I've got a very simple question, because it hasn't been mentioned yet. What's the role of the arts in post-Brexit Britain? <laughs> <laughs> Play me. Wow. There, there's a hole. another <laughs> conference, isn't there? Again, another whole symposium. Um, uh, to, main, to maintain the exchange ties dialogue mm -hmm. and communication with the rest of the world. Here, yeah, yeah. absolutely. For me, my answer is um, there will be no post-Brexit Britain. <laughs> <laughs> and, and Cara? Um, I think there's a really important role for the arts um, in that, that really community level of just keeping different sides or trying to get different sides to talk and to understand whatever happens. Yeah. that's going to be needed. And the arts is just one facet that can help do that. Thank you. OK, in the middle. Oh. Yeah, um, I was just, like, I'm really interested in this uh, place garden notion. Um, and I was just interested in, given a few questions back, we had acknowledged that there's multiple communities within any community or, mm. or space. How do you choose whose place to guard um, and avoid it becoming exclusionary f between different communities operating in one space? Again, that, that is problematic. Mm -hmm. um, so, to be fair, <clears throat> sometimes there's, there's an activist side that I haven't talked about today, in, but, and there's commissions, right? In the commission side, I'm commissioned, and often I'm, I've, I've, had, I've had a choice, and I've worked with different communities, and we've gone with whichever one the, the communities felt had the strongest reaction, I guess. Um, and, and, and in terms of activism, then again, it's in response to, to, to often people's pleas or through, through the network of activists around things like housing or whatever. Um, but all of them are problematic. And obviously, this, it, it, what, what, I'm, what, what I'm trying to do with the help of Arts Council, England's funding and others, is to try and get something where we can build an evidence to show mm -hmm. that community members can be trusted to creatively and build our own community, look after it and develop it without or with very little assistance for us going forward and have it gifted to them or given to them forever. And that once we can show that, and this is what we're doing in places like Cardiff, working with the City Council and the Arts Council of Wales and talking about significant investment into the community to guarantee the long-term cultural infrastructure, which is a, a, as well about the creative industries at its heart as well, to answer the previous question briefly. But through a cooperative, mutually owned principle, rather than it being... So all of the arts organisations in Cardiff are coming together as an alliance to all take own ownership of the means of production. We're talking about, on the one hand, and the means of living and being in communities on the other. And if we can show that, then hopefully that can be something that maybe we can invest a bit more money in in other places going forward. That's the hope anyway, but it might not. Thank you. And I think final question. So thank you so much for this talk. It's really, really interesting. I just want to ask um, about the... Unfortunately, we live in this um, profit-led, developing, development-led uh, capitalist society, whatever. Um, but how do we fight this post-it note exploitation of communities who are asked to, through, de through development, through, um, from developers who are ticking boxes of community engagement? And how do we fight against the exploitation and marginalization of communities within um, that system that we're in? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Laura, can I ask, would you like to respond to that one? Um, it's really hard. Uh, it can be very lonely to feel that you are doing it. Um, I've worked with some developers that I would put on an immediate blacklist. Um, but I've also worked with some developers that have actually 
through a process of time, actually come to see what they do, their role, not just as house builders, but as sort of space makers, really, and have really genuinely got engaged with the community. One of the ways that we've done that is by showing them this is good for your balance sheets. Um, sort of speaking their language, it's really awful and reductive mm -hmm. to do that. But you take them on that journey, and actually then they begin to see a different sort of social <coughs> mission in it. I mean, that's just one slither of it. I think there's something which has been talked about here already today, which is around those governance models, and there are alternative ways of doing things. It's about finding the ways to make those choices, to make to do the different thing. So I think there are some interesting community different models out there rather than just the developer. Thank you. And I wondered whether you might, um, Nick, like to talk a little bit, perhaps the role that the Arts Council might play in that, in terms of just thinking around making the case for a different approach in respect of particularly around property developers and I mean obviously from a local authority perspective we work very closely with them to make sure that, that as much as possible that exploitation doesn't happen particularly through the prism of public art commissioning which is the area that I look after but in terms of the Arts Council. Um, I don't know about the Arts Council itself although I think obviously what I think it's a leadership question at mm -hmm. a national level. Mm -hmm. Because I think the, one of the answers to your question, I think, is that, that overused word, the, lo the community, all right, the local authority, needs to have a very clear idea about what it wants to achieve and not be frightened of setting boundaries mm -hmm. for the developers. Um, that's more easily said in some mm -hmm. places than done in others. But we've just seen so much development in recent years mm. that has had a very short life. Mm. And we need to be thinking of, I mean, it's a rapidly changing world, obviously, we know. No one could have foreseen the collapse of the retail to the degree mm. that it has collapsed in the last eight or nine years. But when I go to somewhere like Leeds and the leader of the council mm. says, well, of course, in the 80s and 90s, the economic generation of Le regeneration of Leeds was on the back of back office insurance companies building office blocks around the station, as it were. Mm. Next, it was retail, <coughs> famously Harvey Nichols. All that's not going to take Leeds very far into the 21st century. And the only thing that will do that is creative industries, mm -hmm. culture, the arts, and the engagement of a wider community in those. I worked with a developer who was doing, they still are, 25-year build, new community for 80,000 people, eight new schools, it was huge. Mm. And their original model was based on selling. The time it took to go through planning, everything that was changing politically and economically in that time, by the time it actually really came to break ground, that model had to completely change, and they realised they were going to be landlords. Mm. And so their investment wasn't just 25 years, it was going to be generations of people mm. and they were amazing to work with it just flipped where they thought their responsibility lay and suddenly it wasn't their stakeholders yeah. that were going to take the profit share it was the stakeholders it was the community they had an initial seeding of people living in this first phase one of the build and started the conversation with them and it was absolutely brilliant because the community turned around and said right those next houses and that next area don't make them like this you want to be doing that and, they listened. and it was a really very, I mean, it was, just, it was just a fantastic project to be involved in. And something like Project Row, Rick started that as a genuine desire to want to give back. But it was never meant to be the solution for the whole of Houston. Mm. It's there as an example. And actually, when you're made, there are so many examples like that that you can use. Each of these examples are very, very specifically site-specific, as they should be. But there are examples out there that you can take, you can adapt, and you can make those cases in other places for it. Just to add, yeah. one answer to your question, I think, is that the Arts Council ought to be talking to the volume house builders because, you know, as I sit on the train and travel around the country and you see all these infill groups of houses mm. without a single tree, mm. beautiful curbs and roads getting to them at great cost, it's really shocking how the resources that are being used are being used so disproportionately. 
And of course, none of them are contributing, except through Section 106s, none of them are contributing to the building of the schools, the libraries, mm. the social facilities that are really required in those communities. Yeah. Partly because they're building 10 houses or yeah. 20 houses. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And then they say, well, why should I build a school if mm. I'm... So I th think Dis we need to get engaged in that, probably. Thank you. I'm very conscious of time, but just very quickly... Sing. I was just going to follow on to that from saying, as well as S106, there's the SILs, the community so, infrastructure yeah. levy, and that's one of the things we're looking at in Cardiff at the moment, yeah. because basically there's a, there's a clear case for a loss of large amounts of the arts industries because of development. And when that happens, that's a loss of infrastructure, and the developer the council needs to make the developer pay mm -hmm. to replace that infrastructure elsewhere in the city. And I think that if we can get these sort of models in place that are just, that they're actually almost legislatory, that mm -hmm. they're there and you ha there has to be built, then we can start to build uh, creative industries and communities in a, with, across the country using money from developers. Absolutely. Well, thank you. That's a brilliant end to note to end on. Thank you so much. Thank you to, to <coughs> you all today. It was a fantastic discussion. Uh,